After 15 years, we finally have a new Indiana Jones film, so it's time to stop and rank all five Indiana Jones films from the worst to the best. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all five Indiana Jones films. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list, and I would love to see yours. Also, I've done other Indiana Jones content. I'm making my way through each of the films, reviewing them, giving my deeper thoughts on them, as well as doing a video on how to fix Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull back several years back at the early part of my channel. You can check all of those out at this playlist right up here, and let's get started. Coming in in last place, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Now, while this is in last place, I don't think it's the absolute abomination that some people make it out to be. Its flaws are so obvious, easy to dunk on, and kind of right there in your face superficial that they can cover up some of the good aspects of the film, where Steven Spielberg still knows how to craft and set up and film exciting set pieces. So the action in the movie, it's still done really well. Not all of it, there's some things that aren't so good, we'll get to that. But there's other parts that have practical stunt work with people swinging from chains and jumping from car to car and motorcycles. Things that are classic Indiana Jones elements. Harrison Ford, still incredibly charismatic and fun to watch in this role. I I don't have a problem with Mutt giving Indiana Jones a happy ending, marrying Marion. I'm cool with all of that. And then <laughs> there's the really silly stuff that it gets so silly that there are images that just pop in your brain. Immediately when you think about this movie, CGI gophers popping up out of the ground. Indiana Jones getting into a refrigerator and then being launched a mile down the road and just kind of getting out like, oh gosh. Man, what a big explosion. Shia LaBeouf swinging with the monkeys. Ending with literal aliens. Excuse me, interdimensional beings popping up in front of them and then UFOs taking off. Like it's so overtly in your face silly at points in time that that's what you think of. It covers up all the things that do kind of work about the film. I think another big problem here is that it, it was an inherently a compromised concept. George Lucas wanted to do a 1950s alien invasion movie and just update the franchise entirely to a different genre. Spielberg, Ford were like, no, that's not a good idea. And so we kind of came up with this compromised idea that's kind of in the middle. That's It feels like the old stuff, same genre, but now it's with aliens. It doesn't quite work. And I think even on just like a story level, it's very weird and convoluted where Ox found the skull and we're returning the skull and exactly what the Soviets are trying to do, what all the different people are trying to do isn't as neat and clean as it was with the other films. So it's just, you you know what you're trying to, where you're trying to go, but it's not exactly clear why we're trying to get there, what the consequences will be. And that's the problem with this movie. It's issues really stand out in your face. I put out a video right at the beginning of my YouTube channel on how to fix this movie or walk through all of my issues with it and try and come up with a better version of it that kind of sticks to the main idea that they were going for here. Final thought on this one, I keep my own crystal skull in that, can I get my, in the house. Whenever I went sober seven years ago, I got rid of all of the, um, alcohol paraphernalia or anything like that in the house for obvious reasons, except for one of my Dan Aykroyd crystal skulls from his crystal skull vodka. Kept this one also for obvious reasons. It's kind of fun. In the film Indiana Jones, the kingdom of the crystal skull, the well-known Mitchell Hedges piece is referenced as well as the concept that some of these heads may have an extraterrestrial origin. We now have a touchstone and a replica, which allows us if we wish to connect to the message of the Crystal Head's purpose on Earth. For Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, of all the movies that have come out this year, and I imagine all of the movies that will come out this year, this is the film where my feelings are the most complex. Some of my earliest childhood memories involving movies 
Go back to Indiana Jones, in particular Last Crusade, which came out during summer of 89, when that's really where I started going to the movies, started having more and more clear memories of being a fan of movies, getting involved in fandom, and falling in love with these characters. In which case, Indiana Jones has been with me for 34 years. I've said it many times before. Several of these movies are in my top 10 favorites of all time. Harrison Ford's one of my favorite actors. Indiana Jones is one of my favorite characters. And I've said many times that I love it when I get to see characters in different stages of life. So when we come back and do a new Indiana Jones film over 40 years after the original, and Harrison Ford is back, and we get to see him in this different phase of life, there's something about that that is inherently magical. It's special. It's nice to see him again. Like, we're getting one final adventure. But that concept of liking to see characters at different phases of life kind of assumes that I want to see them in reality. Like, one of the things I love about Rocky is we got to see him throughout all these ages. I don't know that the same thinking that makes me love the Rocky character applies to Indiana Jones, where there's much more of an escapist fantasy with Indiana Jones. The fantasy, this man in his prime, handsome, intelligent, man of action, always in over his head, but with his resourcefulness, he finds a way to make it through and be victorious, at least in some sense. He doesn't die, the Nazis die, even if he might not get all the relics in the end. That's the fantasy that that every guy wants, that when I was in fifth grade and they asked us what did we want to be when we grew up every guy in my class said oh I want to be an archaeologist because we didn't understand archaeology isn't Indiana Jones and I don't think that works the same with a 70 year old Indiana Jones played by an 80 year old man who's sad and who's lost so much at the same time because he is older And because he is in such a sad place, it allows Harrison Ford to bring all of these new things to the role that he never brought before. And we get to see him in a new light. It takes our hero, the fantasy, and brings him into reality. And in some ways, that makes something more exciting about it because he's not just the fantasy. There's some reality in there. But does every character work better pulled out of fantasy and put into reality? Does every character need to be deconstructed and explored and made sad and depressing? Probably not. Likewise, in order for us to do a movie like this, you have to use so much digital, so much green screen, so much VFX, because you can't do this with your 80-year-old man, that I think I'll also break some of the stuff that made the franchise awesome in the first place. But that's all of this is not to say that it's poorly done. There are things that I wasn't crazy about, things that I don't think worked, but there's a lot of things that did work. You get the action set pieces. You get to see him during World War II. And there's nice bits in there. There's things that I thought were really cool. And if you're going to make a movie about 70-year-old Indiana Jones that's sad, this is maybe the best version of that that you can make. Should you make a movie about sad 70-year-old Indiana Jones? Probably not. Maybe that's not the best idea, but there's things that are a new exploration of the character here. I I mean, I literally have no idea how I will feel about this film a year from now. In third place, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. For me, this is a great follow-up to Raiders of the Lost Ark. And a big part of that is it delivers all the thrills and action that you want from a Raiders movie, but it doesn't just rehash what worked in the first film. It's a very different type of adventure. It starts with Indy off on one escapade and in his efforts to escape everything that came out of that escapade, finds himself stumbling into a different adventure. So we never see him back as Dr. Jones, the professor, we don't see him in the United States at all in this movie. It's all in the middle of everything. Likewise, of all the Indiana Jones films, this is probably the most action-based Indiana Jones film, where it starts off and you get a dance number, a shootout, a car chase, a plane crash, and then flying through the sky, down mountains, and down a river in a life raft. 
all in the first 20 minutes. And then the movie ends with this slam bang finale of fighting people over a lava pit, freeing hundreds of child slaves, a big gigantic fight with a boss, the minecart chase, then the water spraying out of the wall, the bridge fight. I mean, it just moves like a roller coaster in a way that most of the other films don't just kind of have that chaotic of a pace to them, but it fits like chaotic pace is a compliment in this particular context. At the same time, I would say of our original trilogy of films, it's the most flawed of them where Willie probably the worst character in this entire franchise, because there's characters you might like less for various different reasons and how they treat into or whatever, but she's just whiny and annoying. Like they're in the middle of a shootout at the beginning. She's like, oh, I cracked a nail. Someone's trying to shoot you in the face, lady. Like, what are you talking about? Like, What are you getting worked up about? And so just a, an awful, annoying character that besides throwing a punch at during the end of the film, just has no redemption, nothing to make her better. She whines from beginning to end. She's just a damsel in distress. Oh, one other nice thing about this one that I... One thing I really appreciate about the Indiana Jones films is that they don't really treat him as a hero from the get-go. He's much more reluctant. He is seeking out fortune and glory. It's about him. He's in using like a child for labor in a shootout and driving cars and stuff like that. He's a scoundrel, but he has a good side to him. And so he's interesting. There's layers to him. He doesn't decide to save the kids until he realizes, oh, damn, those kids being tortured here. We're, we got to get these kids out of here. And so he has to be won over to the positive cause. And so you even have these little arcs for his character. So I think it, it has its flaws. It slows, it you know, drags a little bit in the middle between our slam bang opening and closing. But a great addition to the franchise that... In a lot of ways, I find to be maybe the most consumable Indiana Jones film because it does move like that roller coaster. Tied for number one, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And this movie set the standard. It set the bar by which every adventure film since has been evaluated. And all of them, save for one movie, which is also on this list, have fallen short by comparison. It is just a classic globe-trotting adventure about this guy that is intelligent, handsome, man of action, and just always finds himself in a mess and just has to desperately claw his way out of it with a little bit of luck and a lot of resourcefulness. Somehow, he survives all the way to the closing credits. It's well documented that some of the origins of this come from conversations between George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, where Spielberg was like, I want to do a James Bond movie. And George Lucas goes, I've got something even better than that. And it was pulling from their inspiration from the old Westerns they watched growing up, Akira Kurosawa, the serials from the 40s, and of course, James Bond. And when you watch this movie, in light of that, you see it. It's this amalgamation of all these different influences into something fresh and exciting. It has all the thrills of all of these things, but it does its own thing with all of it. Of course, this is the movie that solidified Harrison Ford as this leading man that became this dominant force of the last 40 years in cinema. Of course, he was in movies before this, most importantly as Han Solo, but this made it clear, he's not just one off. He's not just that guy that got lucky getting a good role in Star Wars. He's the real deal and can lead a film all on his own. And he's so fun. He's so funny. He has these great smirks and looks, everything. The right amount of humor at just the right times. And then it has all of these iconic sequences that have stood the test of time, being chased by the boulder, the fight in the market where he decides to just grab his gun and shoot the guy. Um, the, of course, the car chase where a stuntman went underneath the car, copying the beat from Stagecoast. doing this 80s version of it. And because it wasn't just about spectacle or anything like that, it was about trying to really do something exciting. The sequences work, 
even 40 years later. All of it, it's memorable. All of it's distinct. All of it is great. This, to me, is an A plus 10 out of 10 movie. But also in first place, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Now, when it comes to just movies in general, their importance on cinema, I think Raiders of the Lost Ark comes out on top. But if you're just doing a ranking of Indiana Jones films, I think there's a few things about this movie that notch out Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think it's more fun. It moves at a faster pace. It has more humor. And of course, it has Sean Connery as Indiana Jones's dad. And as it turns out, they have phenomenal chemistry. And doing that father-son dynamic adds some emotion into the journey that isn't in Raiders. And so its own way, it elevates this film. So that's why for me, they're kind of tied, different rankings, different ones will come out on top. But if I'm trying to like give the fair ranking of which of these movies gets played the most in this household and puts the biggest grin on my face for the largest amount of the runtime, Last Crusade comes out on top in this particular context for this particular ranking. So one of the things that make this movie great, well, it feels like they went, what was everything that was really good about Raiders. How can we tell another story like that, but that adds new depth to the character, new challenges, a new motivation? And how do you do that? You bring in his father. It's still with the Nazis. It's another Christian relic, but it's his father comes into the mix. And who is someone for this Indiana Jones larger than life character that no one catches him off guard, but who could be the person that would be the one person to catch him off, that'll disarm him a little bit, that'll show the more vulnerable side to him, that'll explain why he is the way that he is in the good and the bad ways, that'll just challenge him in a way that's not a villain. You bring in his father, who is great in his own right, but not necessarily a great father, and you send them off on an adventure, and who do you get to play him? You get Sean Connery, the guy that played James Bond, Steven Spielberg's kind of influence that pulled him into this whole world. He wanted to do Bond. Lucas said, I got something better. Now we're getting both at the same time. And despite the fact that Sean Connery is only 12 years or was only 12 years older than Harrison Ford, they're able to absolutely pull this off. They're both like such great actors. They're both so charismatic and they're Banter is so fun. Dad! Oh, Dad! Oh, Dad! Ah! And so believable, and it just works. It adds this nice element into the whole experience from beginning to end. Added to that, even with Indiana Jones, whereas in the first movie, he's motivated by, oh, I've been recruited to be a part of this big, important adventure. This would be cool to be a part of this adventure. Temple of Doom, he just kind of stumbles into it. And once again, it's about fortune and glory. Here, he joins up because he wants to rescue his dad. That's his motivation. That's why he's doing all of this. It's about his father and his dad kind of like has to convince him of the importance of this and why it's so crucial the Nazis don't get it. And I think all of those little elements just, it has a lot of Raiders to it, but it also feels quite different from the film, has a different vibe, a different flavor. And so it complements it's each it complements the original very well. And I think when you look at the original trilogy with all of these different films, they work really nicely to have something different to offer in each of them. Another nice detail in here, it does have that cold open with River Phoenix, Joaquin Phoenix's brother playing young Indiana Jones, kind of showing us some of the origin of where all of this came from. But most importantly, this movie gave me one of my favorite gifts to use on Twitter. When you put it all together, you've got two perfect adventure films in this franchise. So Raiders and Last Crusade come in and number one. If you enjoyed this video, remember I've got more Indiana Jones content right over here. You can check out my reviews of each of the films right up there. Plus you can check out my video on how to fix Crystal Skull, diving into all my issues with it and providing some solutions. Different type of video for my channel. Hope you enjoy it and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.